Today we're going to go over a study where they actually translated um, not FFQ, but a 24-hour um, dietary recall into glycemic index. So as we've begun to see, these um, studies that say low carb is bad, low carb is good, all these studies based on the FFQ, Food Frequency Questionnaire, or other um, food questionnaires tend to have major problems in terms of they really don't talk about glycemic index. Well, there's actually science for that. Uh, this one, again, is not on FFQ, but it's on a 24-hour um, uh, survey. And I'll, we'll see why in a little bit. I think as you begin to see the conclusions and the end of the study, it'll become really clear that yes, no matter which way you slice it, your average uh, African American, European American, middle aged, overweight um, demographic is getting too many, too much glycemic index. Call them short circuit and call them carbs, call them what you will, we need to fix that diet. And it doesn't matter whether the pure study showed that um, low carb uh, actually made people do better or the ERIC study showed that it shortened lifespans. These, um, these studies need to be translated. Now, <clears throat> so let's go back and put a little context around that study. First of all, there's a lot of um, sometimes more heat than light, a whole lot of debate around diet. In fact, it, one of my constant irritations is people telling me we all know what, quote, our ancestors ate, end quote. And evidently our ancestors had uh, chicken and vegetables on a, uh, on a plate. That just doesn't match. Um, <clears throat> I don't even know what our ancest, quote, ancestors, end quote, looked like. Um, never met any. And I certainly never saw a food frequency uh, uh, <clears throat> questionnaire filled out by one of our ancestors. So to try to get some sort of scientific conclusion about the diet of our ancestors, don't you think that's a little bit of a stretch? So... <clears throat> Speaking of uh, dietary uh, surveys and questionnaires, these are hard enough as they are just on people today. Uh, so the teacher says, you should know this. You learned it three years ago. And uh, the response is, I don't even remember what I ate th uh, last week. So again, we don't know what we ate last week. How are we supposed to know what our ancestors ate. <clears throat> Let's dig a little bit deeper in terms of concepts and start thinking about glycemic index versus carbohydrates. Well, what is the glycemic index? Uh, break it down, two words. Glyce um, mean, is coming from glucose, which means the glucose value. Emic, like anemia, emic means in the blood. So sugar in the blood. What's the sugar in the blood index? That's the uh, amount of impact that a certain food will raise blood sugar. Well, now how is that different from glycemic load? Well, <clears throat> let's say you, uh, one piece of bread may have a glycemic index of 63 or 78, depending on what kind of bread it is. But you don't just eat that one piece of bread all day. For your daily glycemic load, you'd have to add that one piece of bread to the other piece of bread that you made in the sandwich, oh, and the mayonnaise and the mustard and the uh, ham and the cheese. <clears throat> um, oh, oh, unless you had peanut butter and jelly, and then you'd have to add the peanut butter and the jelly, and then you have to do that for all your meals, and that'll give you the glycemic load for that day. Again, we're gonna be talking about that in this study. This study actually took what's called a 24-hour recall um, and a couple of dietitians, master's level dietitians, went in and interviewed people to get using standardized um, software. The, uh, in the Nutrition Coordinating Center, uh, they have a 
piece of software that's Windows based and they and the nutritionist interviews you, then they use this and they in, they um, enter the information. It finds matches to the foods that you're describing. For the most part, we'll talk, you know, nothing's perfect. Nothing is that simple. Um, <clears throat> so we'll talk about a little bit more details in that area. Uh, again, um, I don't think that despite what happened in the uh, in this Lancet article or what was shown in the Lancet article about quote lower uh, carbohydrate diets shorten your lifespan I, there's been too much good research um, David Ludwig um, Bob Lustig both uh, pediatric endocrinologists um, both are very uh, comfortable with their message that uh, high carb foods are killing us. Even our kids. Again, both of them specialize in kids uh, endocrinology, and um, both of them run weight management centers. So I don't think that this is only for uh, diabetics and insulin resistant people. I do think that this uh, there is probably something to be said about glycemic load for all of our population. However. I'm not going to get that far. I've just got some very simple issues. I'm dealing with uh, older, middle-aged uh, Americans, and uh, that's what I'm talking about. By the way, who's that good-looking YouTuber hiding behind that image there? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> to get back to glycemic index, high glycemic index versus low glycemic index foods, and what is what are these curves mean this is what the high glycemic index foods do to your blood sugar. This is what low in glycemic index foods do to your blood sugar. Much less of an impact. So let's get in here and list this again. Well everybody knows chips are high glycemic. Biscuits, cakes, ice cream, dates. You may not have known that. Dates are fruit. Supposed to be healthy. Maybe not for um, people with this problem. Um, <clears throat> potatoes. Well, wait a minute. Potatoes are a vegetable, right? Uh, yeah, but not all vegetables are created equal, uh, especially in terms of uh, glycemic index. Processed foods tend to be uh, higher. Depends on which processed food, though. You're, not all processed foods are created equal. How about fruits? Watermelon is a high glycemic index. Oranges, maybe a little bit lower. Orange juice, on the other hand, goes back up higher because it doesn't have the, uh, the cellulose in there, uh, the fiber, to decrease the, uh, the load rate. So, again, as you begin to look at this, what starts off as pretty simple maybe is not so simple. <clears throat> Now, my wife is always telling me, bottom line it, as you might imagine, and well, actually, she's not the only one. I've got plenty of viewers that are continuing to say, bottom line it. Uh, you know where the, this came from. If you go to the movies, they use that in part of their uh, put your cell phone on, uh, turn your cell phone off campaign. This is Ryan Gosling, and I don't know who the actress is, and that's in the notebook, and she's getting up... I saw that scene. I didn't see any of the rest of the movie. But she's getting upset, making the point that, look, life is not that simple. <clears throat> I'd rather see it in more of a medical terminology, a little bit of medical imagery here with the intern with his jacket on. It's just not that simple. <clears throat> so let's get into the study. Those of you who really, really want it simple probably ought to turn it off, go somewhere else, because... Uh, this is going to get into the study. Basically what I'm going to do here is help you understand and help me understand how you can convert a 24-hour food survey into glycemic index and even glycemic load. Why is that important? <clears throat> well, obviously that was not done in e either of the Lancet surveys. We really have little or no clue what kind of glycemic index these foods were, uh, were that these people were eating. So I'll put the uh, contact in the, or the link in the, under the video. 
and <laughs> go through a few things here. They use the 24-hour um, survey uh, to get glycemic index and glycemic load. Um, they use the international table of glycemic index, in other words, to match foods. There's a software, as I mentioned before. <clears throat> this is the software from the Nut Nutrition Coordinating Center. I think this is located in Minnesota. And the uh, software is the NDRS, Nutrition Data System for Research. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> so that's just linking the food in the history. Again, there were two master's level uh, um, nutritionists interviewing these people. They blinded their results to themselves and to each other, and they had a lot of overlap and reanalyses to see what sort of uh, uh, correlation there was between readings. And the correlation was good. <clears throat> Now that's just identifying the food and standardizing the label of the food. After they do that, <clears throat> then they have to change the food to a glycemic index. And there's a couple of um, standards for doing that. This one is from the University of Sydney. That was one of the two that were used. The other one is the international table and they refer to that several times as well. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> glycemic index is different. Well, let me, let's just, before I jump over that, they took 1,261 carbohydrate containing foods in the database. Um, they were able to uh, just do a simple glycemic index on uh, what, about 22%? The other 78% of the carbohydrates they had to do more of a, an estimation and calculation <clears throat> using the percent of uh, ingredients in the food and these methods that I'm just discussing. As you can imagine, that would be a huge effort, taking that from all those FFQs. I mean, we're talking 40, 50,000 in the Lancet studies, the recent Lancet studies, the Pure study and the ERIC follow-up. So, I don't expect to see that happen anytime soon, but I'd love to see it happen. I'd love to see them take those two studies and convert them to glycemic index, glycemic load. <clears throat> there were um, 1,261 carbohydrate containing foods. 602 were a direct match for 22%. 656 were estimated contributing 78% of the carbohydrates. The daily glycemic index was 84. White bread, uh, uh, is what, in the 80s? The average glycemic load was 196. So these people are eating a lot of carbs and a lot of high glycemic carbs. Who were these people? These people were predominantly uh, middle-aged, overweight um, African-American and European-Americans. Um, <clears throat> where did they come from? I think we'll see that somewhere in this study. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm not finding it right now. I've already covered most of this. Aren't you glad that I covered that verbally in terms of basically what we're talking about here is um, it's a background. Carbohydrates have been labeled as simple and uh, complex, but you know what? That doesn't really help. It's glycemic index, which is the impact on health, not simple versus complex carbohydrates. Uh, how do you measure uh, glycemic index, you give somebody the food and then you do a two-hour oral glucose tolerance test. Um, <clears throat> which is better, glycemic index or glycemic load? Obviously, the glycemic load is much more important. It's a physiologic effect of the food rather than a theoretical effect. And we don't eat just one piece of bread. We eat... Um, I don't eat much bread at all anymore, but those of us that eat it, uh, eat other things as well. So, 
the international table um, of glycemic index and glycemic loads was one of the two standards. The other one used for glycemic load was the University of Sydney table. Um, <clears throat> They were able to find almost all of the foods using those two tables. Now here's an interesting, um, I tell you what, it's getting late. I'm going, uh, getting long. I'm going to have to, um, to cut off or I won't be able to save the entire video. I'll do another part on this, but I will just say, um, basically they found these people were, were uh, getting way too many high index glycemic load carbs. Talk to you in part two in just a few minutes.